So uh, we're here with Robin Nibbler, Director of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the well-known Chatham House. It's good to have you here, Robin. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, and uh, let me express uh, our solidarity to, to the British people, <laughs> certainly those who uh, feel themselves as European citizens yeah. going through rough times. Yeah. When, when, where is this taking us? How do you, where do you see the end game of this? Well, look, where I hope we see the end game is that even if Britain leaves the EU, that we have a Britain that ends up perhaps being a more comfortable partner to the rest of the EU than it was as a member. That would be probably the optimum outcome, to be frank. Even a second referendum might lead to a continuation of the debate about Britain's future in Europe, demands for a third referendum, uh, a sense of insecurity by British political leaders. So where I hope this takes us at the very, you know, from an optimistic perspective would be uh, a Britain that if it's outside the EU has been able to negotiate as close a relationship as possible such that even outside, although it takes a bit of an economic cost and Britain will definitely be less influential, I think, in a foreign mm -hmm. policy sense, mm -hmm. it may have a more comfortable relationship with the European Union. That's the optimistic scenario. The negative scenario, I'm afraid, is that we don't come to any agreement and Britain drops out without an agreement and sort of has to use the EU as the, as the reason for its failings, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the problem for us, is we're stuck between these two narratives. But at the moment, I would say uh, there's, a, there's a more than 50% chance mm -hmm. of the more apt optimistic outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if we take this more optimistic outcome as the baseline, it is certain that a UK that will emerge out of Brexit will be more autonomous in the sense of setting its own legislation and so forth. But will it also be more sovereign in the sense of being able to command the kind of or to, to influence the outcomes of these decisions? I mean, isn't that a terrible time to leave the European Union with global challenges at their peak, with the certain tenant in the White House being what he is, with the erosion of the multilateral order which yep. the UK has supported throughout the decades and continues to support at a time when it seems that the values and interests of the UK converge with those of Europe more than they do with those on the other side of the Atlantic. But the problem for us and for any country is that sovereignty is imagined and sovereignty is real. And most of the public are more interested in the imagined sovereignty. And people like you and I, or Chatham House and Elia Mep, tend to focus more on real sovereignty. In real sovereignty terms, Britain will end up probably being a rule taker mm -hmm. on big areas of our economic activity, mm -hmm. of our trade, of the regulatory environment that we have to operate mm -hmm. in. In those areas, we either follow US rules, or EU rules, or maybe China rules. It'd be very hard for us to define our own. But the British public will simply be aware that their government and their parliament has the right to uh, determine in a sovereign sense the domestic environment of Britain. Mm -hmm. How many hours you can work. Uh, we decide how many immigrants we take or don't take. Uh, we decide regulation on the standards of water or the standards of air quality. Not in the traded environment, which we are more interested in, but in that day-to-day -day life citizens will believe their government is more sovereign and they may accept that imagined sovereignty mm -hmm. and make them feel more comfortable even though politicians will then have to struggle with the loss of real sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, but look, we live in a democracy and in democracies today this is the way around. Now there's another dimension to sovereignty which is the one you mentioned of Britain, Brexit Britain in a more competitive world. Big powers, Russia, the United States, China, the EU. Um, Britain will be trying to navigate its way between them. It'll have to have a more active foreign policy. The one positive, I suppose, is there are other countries in the same position as Britain. Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, Singapore. There are a lot of mid-sized countries that don't really belong to any particular mm -hmm. unit that are trying to sustain a more multilateral global level of rules and perhaps we can work with those to you know to have some type of influence mm -hmm. of the sort we could not have when we were in the EU mm -hmm. and I think it depends how the EU works out yep. I mean how confident can we be that the EU will be sovereign as Bruno Le Maire has described it to me or even as an empire uh, a peaceful empire as he described it recently 
um, given that there are such different views within the EU of what to use that sovereignty for. So we could see an E3 or an E5 yep. or an E4 yep. existing alongside European foreign policy with Britain being a player on yep. policy, yep. on climate, yep. on Iran, even towards the US. Yeah, yep. We've already seen, uh, apparently, an interest in joining a, a closer security cooperation with the EU. How would you describe the, the exact relationship that you deem as most plausible with the EU and, and, and the UK after Brexit? Will it be some sort of participation in the single market, even by way of, of regulatory equivalence? Will it be part of the customs union? How, what, what do you deem to be the most likely scenario? I think if Britain leaves, yeah, and formally leaves mm -hmm. at some point in the next two weeks to a year, um, then I think we end up with regulatory shadowing mm -hmm. and at best equivalents, because the EU has already said no to mutual recognition. Mm -hmm. I think we end up with as... Uh, 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 customs is the most complicated area because of the relationship with Northern Ireland yeah. and that Irish border. Yeah. But I think it is more than likely that we will live in a limbo of a customs type of union where we're sort of inside the customs union for maybe up to four years until it's possible for Britain to arrive at a more technical solution to mm -hmm. not having a border. But mm -hmm. I do not see a Britain that is a member of the customs union the way Turkey is, yeah. where uh, the EU negotiates our external tariff yeah. on goods and then we try to capture yeah. some type yeah. of uh, uh, equal treatment yeah. inside that third market of that third country post hoc mm -hmm. after that mm -hmm. environment, which is what, yeah. in essence, being in the customs union will be. The Labour Party, which has pushed this idea that Britain can leave the EU in the single market but be in the customs union, that's just a, a political domestic position that's not been thought through. Mm -hmm. The EU cannot afford to break its own sovereignty yeah. by giving a non-member like Britain a special voice. Absolutely. What, what do you envisage would be the consequences for the European Union mm -hmm. after Brexit? I mean, there are two points of view. One is that the EU comes out uh, as weaker than it was, having lost a, a very crucial member, especially in the areas of foreign policy, security. Yeah. Um, the, growth, the, the momentum towards deeper integration, which seems to be the only way forward, if an, even if it comes to the form of enhanced cooperation. The other view is that the EU comes stronger yep. uh, by, by, uh, putting, by, by having a, a permanent obstacle out of the way. Yep. Um, and the UK has been, as you described in the beginning, a very reluctant partner from the beginning. So this could have its positive implications, and it already seems that there are certain parties and certain governments even that are increasingly positioned in a more positive way vis-a-vis -vis a UK departure. What's your take on the implications for the European Union? Look, I think you described very well the difficult balance here um, for the EU. My leaning would be to say that Brexit, if it happens, will mean that there is possible, it's possible to have a more honest debate inside the EU about the way forward. A lot of countries have hidden behind Britain's reluctance and blamed Britain in many cases for the lack of progress when we know the French are quite skeptical about certain types of defense integration, as are the Germans as well. So I think we are uh, in a situation where we could perhaps have a more honest conversation uh, or the EU members can have a more honest conversation about their way forward. Um, the reality is, from my reading, that within the U27 there is an honest difference of opinion about how much deeper integration they should be. I hope that the EU does more and less integration, not more or less. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. Um, there's clearly need for deeper integration in data markets, in energy security, maybe in some areas of domestic security. However, the idea that you could have a common EU-wide approach to immigration, I think, is fanciful. Um, and I'm even skeptical, I have to say, about some of the really deep monetary, uh, some of the deep fiscal union that's required yeah. for the next stage of monetary union. Yeah. Although I understand its necessity, mm -hmm. I think politically the idea that today you would be withdrawing fiscal sovereignty from member states when they're still in that process of trying to escape from the post-financial crisis is a very high political risk, yeah. I think, for the yeah. EU. So I think what Brexit's <coughs> departure allows the U27 to have is a more honest conversation mm -hmm. about its future. And what we'll end up with, I hope, 
is a slightly more pragmatic EU mm -hmm. that deepens its integration in practical areas that mean something to the citizens, but allows <coughs> national governments to, to regain the trust of their populations, because without that trust, the populations will not give the authority to the governments mm -hmm. to do deeper integration in really political areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hope they hold off on real political integration for at least five to ten years. Mm -hmm. And maybe with Britain not there, mm -hmm. people don't have to keep defending the political view of Europe, because in a way, we're not the, the counter the counterbalance. Yeah, yeah. well, the, there are enough uh, skeptics at an intergovernmental level exactly. already. To, uh, to, to block any more But they can be more, more honest about it. Steps. They don't have to feel guilty yeah. about it. Before being on the side of yeah. Britain almost yeah. uh, delegitimized yeah. Yeah. the more intergovernmentally minded governments. Yeah. But with Britain out, yeah. it becomes a more honest debate between two groups of countries, or more, that have different views about where to take integration. Britain was just against integration in general. Yeah. And as a non-member of the Eurozone, we were more and more of an uncomfortable member. Yes, and we have seen that in the obstacles posed by the neo Hanseatic League vis-à-vis uh, yes. -vis further integration of the Eurozone and so forth. On, on the shorter term, uh, will the UK participate in the European elections and what will be the outcome uh, of, of a British vote uh, regarding the consequences and, and the broader outlook uh, to which it will contribute for the European Union? I think it's unlikely that the Conservatives and Labour will be able to come to an agreement that gets a majority of Parliament before May 23rd. It is possible, but for that to happen, I think it would require some type of second referendum. Mm -hmm. And a second referendum is a really difficult thing for parliamentarians to agree to, and I don't think it's something that they could really arrive at an agreement on in three weeks, four weeks. So if we are still members by May the 23rd, we will have to have participate in these European parliamentary elections. It may even become a source of, of excitement in relative terms in the country because what you're finding happening is that the two wings of the debate are being energized by the European parliamentary elections. The Brexit party is saying we will win this again, you know, we will tell them once, tell them again, yes? Whereas what you're finding this new independent group, which is creating a group probably called Change UK, mm -hmm. um, are, they've had 3,000 applications for their 73 seats. Um, and there's a real momentum because neither the Conservative Party nor the Labour Party are seen as really carrying the flame mm -hmm. for an effective relationship of Britain with the EU. So you could end up with those who are most interested in the EU debate really being galvanized, being mm -hmm. motivated by this European parliamentary mm -hmm. debate, mm -hmm. and then it becomes difficult for those to pull mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are in there, what that tells me is the two wings yeah. may come out strongest. UK, which means the nationalists the Party, for Europe. Yeah. Now, remember and Brexit, already the, the UK, the yeah. Brexit Party, already won the largest number of seats last time in 2015. They have uh, uh, 24 of the uh, 70 or so seats that the UK has. And at the moment, they seem to be polling the highest again. Uh, and what they're doing is they're taking votes from Labour, mm -hmm. just as I think uh, the, UK, the uh, Change UK, the new sort of pro-EU party, will t probably take votes from the Liberal Democrats and from uh, the Labour Party. Uh, and so what you could and, end up And from with, the Conservatives at all? You know, the Conservatives, uh, could get, I think the Conservatives will probably lose more to the Brexit party, yeah. and maybe some will go, because there were some very centrist Conservatives, mm -hmm. they'll go probably also over to the independent... Uh, some of the independents yeah. come from the Conservative so, so, party. So what you end, they'll go both ways, yeah. because the Conservative party is split. So the hard Brexiteers will go to the Brexit party, the soft, who want a sensible outcome, will go probably the other way. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a protest vote by both groups. Mm -hmm. Now what that means, however, is it could, or the moment, I think the Socialists and Democrats were hoping that the Britons being in the European parliamentary election would give more votes then to the Socialists and Democrats, the S&D party, but they may be disappointed. Um, and what we might find is either Aldi or even the Macron side mm -hmm. might find mm -hmm. that they acquire mm -hmm. uh, some extra votes yeah. uh, of these kind of new British party that's just about having a functional relationship with the yeah. EU, but yeah. is not excited about deep, deep integration, is not EPP. Either way, it's not going to be good for the EPP in terms of its relative balance. Not with good the other for the parties. EPP, and I think it's not good for the EPP because they lose any, uh, uh, they lose the chance of getting those extra votes um, uh, that would have happened if Britain was out of the EU. 
um, and I think it may be less good for the S&D party than it would have been as they originally thought. Robin, thank you very much. Hey, pleasure. I hope it uh, answers some of the questions at least. Thanks a lot.